This is 40K Today. 40K news that's bigger than a Castellan knight standing on top of a pair of Land Raiders and using them as roller skates. Hey, that should be a thing. Hello and welcome to 40K Today. It is Thursday, August the 20th, and we have an awesome program for you. I'm your host, Seamus Ronan, and today we'll be sitting down with Bam, the TO who ran Flying Monkey, a 74-person major that was held this past weekend. Even in these trying times, a few fairly large 40k tournaments are popping up, Flying Monkey included, and who better to give us their insights than Peter the Falcon himself? With the return of 40k Stat Center, we had to bring Pete back on to give us the inside scoop and some of his insights as to how the meta is developing. Before we get started, however, let's take a look at this week's poll. Our question was simple. Are you happy with the change to Old Marines, giving them two wounds like their Primaris Battle Brothers? 77% of you said that they needed it, and 23% said no. They're already tough enough. Some people are saying it's awesome, others say they wish it was only the Terminators and Veterans. But there's one thing I definitely agree with. James said, Don't think they necessarily needed it, to be honest, but from a thematic perspective, it absolutely fits with the stories and the legends of the Space Marines. And as a not-so-competitive player myself, I certainly don't mind fluffy changes like that. Alright, let's get on with the show. First up is Bam from the Flying Monkey Con team, and he has very proudly hosted one of the first events of 9th edition. Our very own John Damaris got to chat with Bam about the difficulties hosting a tournament this large during the COVID-19 pandemic, the top tables, and some takeaways from the weekend. All right, 40K Today fans, we have the one and only Bam, or some people call him Brian, I suppose, from the Flying Monkey, who just ran a huge GT, 74 players. Brian, how are you? Or Bam, how are you? I am good, man. Just a, just a man and his will to survive. Oh, man. You have the eye of the tiger. That's amazing. That's it. So let, let's, let's talk about the Flying Monkey GT, which Dan Salmons just won with Salamanders. You guys had 74 players. How was the event? You know, how was running an event in the post-COVID world and all of that fun stuff? Well, I mean, there's always the danger of things getting further restricted or, uh, you know, last minute getting changed on us. And we were kind of sweating up there till the till launch time that if stuff got changed or stuff got uh, got dialed back any further, that we were going to be out of business. And we had to pretty much make a good plan. We had to have a floor layout. We had to have maps. We had to run stuff by the hotel legal. We had to get their approval. We had to show how we were complying with the local guidelines and, and safety precautions and, you know, we had to be able to follow the hospitals or not the hospital, the, uh, the hotels rules for COVID. So, you know, this is not our first year doing this, but it's our first year running it in this way. So there was a lot of added stress that we previously years we had not had. OK, looking back now that you've done it, um, what would what advice would you give other people who are looking to run an event? Is it is it like an insurmountable task to do or was it now that you've done it once you feel like it, it could become pretty standard operating procedure? I, I really don't think it would be that difficult. I think you do have to, uh, you know, you can't be doing stuff at the last minute, which I'm guilty of. You have to make sure that you have a good game plan in place. And it's not just me. You know, I got a partner, uh, Matt Neely and another partner, uh, Duncan, and the three of us do it together. So we all kind of handle different things together. So it's not one person just going it alone. I don't know if a major worth a darn can really be ran by one person. So um, I would start planning ahead of time. You know, if you are having an event hosted somewhere, just make sure that they're able to, you know, get you the things you need. Like we had to have a floor plan. And uh, so we needed to make sure that we had a floor plan. We had enough tables that could be spread out. And so they'd be more than six feet apart. Uh, we had to be able to make sure that all that stuff was laid out and plotted out ahead of time and uh, just kind of had to tackle it bit, bit by bit, you know, and then doing things like what are the hotels guidelines um, can we put this yes. group over here, this group over here and set these sanitizing and PPE and all that fun stuff. So, all right, that's enough. That's enough. Talk about COVID. Let's talk about the actual event. Let's get back to what we're here for, which is 40 K content. How was it? Were you, there, was there any surprising lists and, and sort of what was your impression of the meta? The meta was a little bit different than I thought it was going to be. Uh, you know, I knew we all know space Marines are, are pretty hot in a lot of ways. And, uh, it's not a bad thing, I don't think. I know a lot of people think it's the end of the world, but I am a fan of Space Marines being good. Uh, so the the surprises for me were uh, uh, Colin McDade, I think, uh, was staying around the top tables with his Harlequins, which uh, I think in a lot of instances, Harlequins might have been better uh, than people were giving them credit for. Or maybe it's just a, a testament to McDade's uh, playing. 
I do think, uh, I think at the end of the day, I thought custodies were going to be better than they were. Um, it might've been, you know, the, the player skill level, but I'm wondering if custodies are going to wind up being a gatekeeper. I thought they were going to be a lot better than they were. Um, you know, death guards seem solid, but again, you know, they didn't seem to be doing as well as I thought they were going to. And, uh, at the end of the day, you know, the, the, the salamanders with the, the master artisans and all, all that gimmick seem to be king. Yeah, those Salamander armies are just super efficient, and they have super efficient stratagems, right? Plus one to wound, ignoring minus one, which, you know, is their chapter tactic or whatever. And then, uh, uh, obviously, the Master Artisans on everything is really, really, really powerful. So um, were people excited to get back to, like, you know, this was, the I think, the first major that's been run in the U.S., right, since COVID hit? I, I believe so. And, uh, you know, and, and I've had the luxury of being, you know, two of the early GTs for ninth edition. And let me tell you, there's some rules interactions that uh, Games Workshop's going to have to hopefully step up and figure out at some point. Uh, the, the attitude was good, though. Like, we had people talking to us and saying, uh, we're glad you guys still put this on. You know, like I, I think one thing that gets overlooked in all this is sometimes that people still need that social interaction. They still need that to to get out and do some things to feel like they're being normal. Um, and a lot of the attitude was just of gratefulness and fun and having a good time. And I had people coming up and just saying that like they were just having fun and they were glad to be rolling dice. You know, and like the my team kind of had the whole like the gang's all here mentality. So it was pretty cool that everybody got to get together and kind of hang out and just, just spend some quality time playing some toy soldiers, man. Yeah, man. That's what it's all about. Right. So yeah. let's tell yeah. everybody uh, where, where they can, you know, make plans to go to flying monkey next year. Cause it's a great event. It's a great Midwest event. Where are you guys located? And do you have a date for next year yet? We do not have a date for next year yet, but we do have a website. Uh, it's going to be a minute or two before it gets updated. Cause we're kind of, we're going to take a few weeks off before we kick in the next year, but uh, www.flyingmonkeycon.com. And uh, we're also Flying Monkey Con on Facebook. Uh, every year we've been holding it at the Drury, which uh, the Drury Hotel in Broadview is a, it's a historic hotel in downtown Wichita. Uh, it's right on the river. It's, it's really cool. It's one of the, one of the, I think one of the dopest locations for a tournament tournament in the Midwest and we've we've grown and grown and grown. And this year we we're going to shoot for 100. And we kind of got set back in the 100 because we just we just couldn't do that. And, you know, socially distance and have the space that we needed because we also run an uh, Age of Sigmar GT at the same time. So it's not just 40K. Um, we also have an Age of Sigmar GT. Cool. All right, dude. Well, I will be there next year. I would have been here this year, but uh, I haven't got my models back from my painter yet. So I couldn't come. But we'll oh, see no. you next year, dude. Yep. Well, uh, if you could not have, if you couldn't have made it, though, I do know that we had Jason Horn there all weekend. He is a a bona fide certified Warhammer hero, and uh, Jason Horn runs Lord Marshall TV, and uh, Jason was there streaming all the games that well, not all the games, uh, a lot of games over the weekend. So you get to see the top game play out. There was some Salamander on Salamander Crime. And then you get to see, you know, five different, you know, varied list and, and players that were at the event and, and how they did things. So um, if you want to catch up with what we had going on, you can go to Lord Marshall TV and watch the games from the weekend. So that's a good way to be there if you couldn't be there. And then, of course, next year, I hope to I hope you guys can make it. All right, Dieter. We'll talk soon. Thanks again. All right. Thanks, Sean. That was John Damaris speaking with Bam. Sounds like another successful event in the books, and I cannot wait to see more. We'll be putting a link in the show notes so you can check out what went down over the weekend over at Lord Marshall TV. Up next, Peter the Falcon. Today's episode of 40K Today is brought to you by Frontline Gaming. Frontline Gaming is a one-stop shop for all your Warhammer hobby needs, discounted products, American-made gaming mats and terrain, and a full line of miniatures painting service and daily hobby content. And this can all be found at FrontlineGaming.org. Welcome back. Our good friends over at 40K Stat Center had to go on a bit of a hiatus due to the state of the world. Turns out, it's really hard to run tournaments during a global pandemic. And because of that, there weren't any stats for the books. Until now. With a few tournaments popping up, 40K Stat Center is back. And we got our longtime friend of the show, Peter the Falcon, to break down his first impressions of the ninth meta with our very own John Damaris. Kaka! I've always Ka-ka! wanted to do that. Oh, <laughs> man. Welcome, Peter the Falcon, back to 40K Today. It's been too long, buddy. We've missed you so much. Aw, uh, well, thanks. I've missed you guys, particularly you. You're probably the second most handsome person in 40K. 
All right. Let's talk about some 40K. So we've now had <clears throat> a few events, enough events to where you might see some trends. I mean, nothing we can count on for sure because the you know the statistical pool is not deep. No, but- not at all. But like we, we're starting to see some trends, like you said. Yeah. Um, there have been, um, what, three GTs, a major now. Uh, multiple almost GTs, five round events that, um, you know, due to COVID restrictions are playing at 20 to 25 players. Um, and there've been a lot of RTTs. We've even had uh, TTS results, uh, tabletop simulator. Um, so like we've got enough data if, if you want to dig into it that you can start to make some like early conclusions on where the meta currently is. Um, but as you kind of uh, alluded to, it's still early and it can change very abruptly because there's so few games. It's hard to know when the meta is actually settled. Oh, people are learning how to play ninth edition too. Exactly. <laughs> so that's big. That's real big. There, there's a lot of uh, what we'll call it undiscovered country where things that are good now might not be good in the meta three months from now because people have figured out ninth edition. Exactly. Right? And it's something that's very unique now um, because with eighth edition we were and without COVID, we had, you know, eight GTs a week. Um, so it was like the meta adjusted so fast. It only took maybe two weeks tops after a new book or an FAQ came out before you could kind of see like, oh, the meta has already kind of resolved itself again um, with the the occasional exception. Now, um, like every week we're seeing in these very small events, um, you know, something new pop up that's a little exciting. You know, maybe there's some hope for certain things. It's it's really, I like it. I think it's great. I, I There's a part of me that hates it because I love the, having the statistics and being able to say, you know, here's the firm results, but I also enjoy not knowing. I love going into games like that I'm watching now and being like, I don't know if these guys are going to win or not. Like, um, I think this army is pretty bad right now. And then they surprise me. And I love that. Yeah, actually, I love that, too. It kind of reminds me back in the day when I first started playing Magic the Gathering. It was in 1993 mm-hmm. and there was no Internet, really. I mean, the Internet existed, but it was like, I mean, it took about, not- you know, 45 minutes to download a, a JPEG. So, yeah. right. But one of the great things was in that time period, nobody knew anything. So it was this dis- the discovery was playing the game um, yep. as opposed to doing the research online. And there's something that's really, really fun about that. And this isn't quite that. Don't get me wrong. I mean, there is still information online. It gets disseminated very quickly. But because of COVID, the pace at which it's discovered has been slowed down is like what I think you were alluding to. Yeah, dramatically. It makes, yeah. It makes the exploration more fun for the rest of us because we don't just look at it online. We actually get to participate in it and draw our own conclusions and, and sort of enjoy that journey. So I'm super excited about that. Yep. No, it's great. I love, I love it. I love seeing new things pop up. Um, it's, there's uh, so many more people that I'm, uh, you know, leaning on and listening to than I would have done um, near the end of eighth when, you know, you could, you could rely on certain people to know where things were headed. Um, now, you know, Joe Schmo comes out with a list and you have to say, you know, well, maybe that is how you're supposed to play ninth edition now. Cause no one maybe really knows yet. So, okay. Well, so that being said, what are you seeing? What is the data saying? I've got to think that salamanders have to be up there pretty, pretty good because I've seen results. Where yeah. They've won a few, a few yeah. Events, so so. Oh, salamanders are definitely in the, like the, t- the top echelon. Um, even if you just go from, a a T whip or a, um, you know, like a, a top level win perspective. Um, Alex Harrison won the Vanguard Super Series. He also won two RTTs and a almost GT over the weekend in the UK. It was a uh, 26 players, I believe, um, five games, all with Salamanders, all with like slight tweaks on that same list. Um, and then we also had the Flying Monkey uh, Manger happen over the weekend, which was the top table was two Salamander players. They were the only two players um, to be five and zero oh, uh, heading into that into the sixth round. Uh, David Villarreal and um, Dan Sammons, um, very similar lists and not exactly the same, but they took a lot of the same um, pieces. Just how they played them were differently. Uh, David went with. Um, like uh, core salamanders where Dan went with a um, a successor chapter to get that extra three inch range on all his flamers. So we got to see that in action. It's a very brutal list because it's it um, the, the smaller board size makes it very easy for it to take up space very quickly. It makes a lot of use out of reserves, very powerful. So they're sitting in the mid sixties for win rate right now, um, which is very high. Uh, generally you, you don't want to see anything higher than the, the kind of low to mid fifties. 
Um, that being said, it's early. Who knows like if something will bring it down. White Scars also making a lot of big showings uh, from the Space Marine faction as well, which we've been hearing a lot of from top tier players. They haven't won anything yet, but a lot of like four and ones, five and ones coming out of White Scars as well. Very cool. So I saw that there was some sort of unexpected actors that have sort of peeked up their head. And I use actors intentionally because Harlequins <laughs> have been doing very well, right? Harlequins have been doing fantastic. So there was a 1,750 point event. I believe you guys uh, talked to him. Matt, Matthew Bodnar, Chuck, uh, won the boardroom brawl with Harlequins. Uh, Colin McDade went five and one with Harlequins at the, um, uh, the Flying Monkey as well. Um, we also saw um, Harlequins make it to the final of the Tactical Tortoise Invitational, um, losing to Space Wolves, another army that has not seen the light of day in a while. They, uh, Space Wolves actually won that uh, that whole tournament. Um, but yes, Harlequins, Frozen Stars with lots of uh, troops, generally running fusion pistols, um, generally a few of the boats so they can uh, get get around a little quicker and have a little protection, um, doing a lot, a lot of work. Um, once again, an army that likes to kind of get in that mid range and then get into close combat right afterwards, very fast, um, and a durable enough. Now we're fi where you're not going to table them on turn six, um, which used to be a big problem with Harlequins was they, they gassed out before the end of the game. Now with a one round less, it's a little easier for them to stay on the board. Um, they do have a couple struggles as was, if you watch the, uh, table, the, um, the, the, the game, that finals game for the Tactical Tortoise uh, Invitational, um, anything that can make them fight last um, really hurts their chances in a lot of matchups. So that's really cool. Um, and then Orcs are another big one that are, while their win percentages and everything aren't where you'd kind of like them to be, they're playing exactly like I saw a lot in 8th, where um, they have a lot of guys on the low end, and then there's like three or four people that are ultra carrying them on the top end. Um, we had the Warzone Gigabytes event that saw two Orc players in the top three. Um, the Adelaide GT in Australia had a win for Orcs. So while their win rates are really low, we're seeing you know a, um, really good showing, particularly out of buggy lists out of Orcs. We'll have to see if the FAQ changes that, where they lost the War Boss on Biker. Um, but yeah, we're starting to see this trend um, where Space Marines are doing it very well, as I think everyone expected. They didn't lose a lot. Um, coming into this edition, they're only getting better. Harlequin's doing fantastic, which is great for them. Um, the only other faction I haven't brought up is, and I'm sorry for for not letting you talk, but I'm just so excited about talking about the game. Um, yeah, go, is, go, go. Uh, um, Adeptus Custodes. A lot of people featured them as like a top tier army coming into ninth because they got so many upgrades. And I think, and this is kind of my early prediction, is what you're going to see and what we've already seen is Adeptus Custodes are going to win a lot of RTTs. And they're going to go four and one a lot at GTs, but I don't think they're going to win that many events. I feel like they are um, very poised to be a gatekeeper army, which is unfortunate because they're like my favorite thing in the world. And they can win a GT. They're, it's just the lists we're seeing right now, and maybe someone will find a list that just works better than everything we've seen so far. But there is, um, they they all have a kryptonite, and if and uh, in a five round tournament, they're meeting it, and then. You know, they they lose that game. They go four and one. Um, their win percentages are very high. They're just as high as Salamanders, but they don't have that that T whip that uh, that Salamanders and other Marine factions are, are are putting out because they can't get to that fifth game before taking a loss. Because they hit that Kryptonite. Which... They hit that Kryptonite, and it depends on the build, right? And that's kind of what happens with skew lists. It's like with Imperial Knights and Eighth, they had very good win rates. Their T whip wasn't terrible. Um, a lot of people played them. Like Custodes are. Um, at the same play rate right now as Space Marines, about 12%, um, so very high. Um, and uh, But what we're seeing is, uh, just like Imperial Knights, um, they're like a low to mid-table terror, where because they skew so hard in one direction, there's a bunch of lists that just, unless you planned for them, you don't have an answer. Um, but then you go into that one list that's like, well, two up armor saves are not, uh, not a big deal to me. Um, like with some of these Salamanders lists we're seeing that put out mortal wounds, etc., and they just pick them up and continue about their way. Very cool. Well, thanks, Peter. We really appreciate the meta update. Hopefully, we can get you back here before too long because I, I think we're going to start seeing more events popping up because people are figuring out how to run them now safely. Uh, and there's I a lot so. of places in the in the world where uh, COVID is being tamped down pretty good, so the restrictions are loosening. In some yep. places, so and one thing All I'll right. say, boys, if that's if you are going to these events, stay safe, be careful. 
Um, it's not fixed, but if you guys, if you can do it as safely as possible, then, you know, you do, you live your life, but just be careful. Be careful. It's yep. not gone. That's a fact. All right. Thanks, Pete. No problem. Talk to you later. That was our own John Damaris speaking to Peter the Falcon. And let me say, it feels so great that the Stats Center is back on the airwaves. Like John said, it's been far too long. We'll be putting a link in the show notes so you can go check out their comeback episode. All right, everyone. Time for 40K's favorite earworm. It's time for the model of the day. It's the, the model of the day, the, the model of the day, the, the model of the day. This model is a stunning kit bash with so many little details that you could look at it for an hour and keep finding something new. This Primaris Chaplain is done up as a member of the Legion of the Damned. Some standout points are the OSL from the torch and the joints of the armor. The crisp, tiny writing on his vestments is so perfectly executed. The candles on the standard and the wispy smoke coming out of the poor bloke on the base ensure that head to toe, there is something cool to look at. I highly recommend taking a peep at this one. It is a marvel. If you'd like your models to be featured on the show, make sure to use the hashtag 40K Today on Instagram. That's 40K, the number two, day. Or just send us a message on Facebook. And that's it for the show. Many thanks to our content producer, Alex Bankter, and our social media whiz, Tanya Gates, for all the work they put into the show. Without them, this thing would not be possible. And for John, Paul, Steve, and the rest of the team, I'm your technical producer, Seamus Ronan, and that's what's happening in 40K Today.